Praise God. And so we're going to be continuing in our series, How I Think About Things. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. And so we're at overtime in this series because I had thought to bring it to a conclusion, but I've got a few more ideas that God has given um, to touch on. So this morning I want to talk about how I think about my flesh. How I think about my flesh. Let's look at it this morning. The Bible says this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, or but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of of God. The first thing I want to do this morning is to identify the flesh. What do I mean when I say that word, the flesh? Genesis 2 and verse 7 declares to us that God formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living being, a living soul. He was formed out of the dust of the earth. He became a living being being a soul, a living entity, when God breathed into him the breath of life. There are two aspects of our being, that which is the physical, which is the seen, and that which is the spiritual, which is the unseen. You see my physical body, but you do not see my soul. You do not see my spirit. God, through the flesh, gave us physical consciousness for the physical and material context in which he set us in. We need physical consciousness because we live in a physical and material world. God also gave us a soul and spirit. This is self-consciousness and God consciousness. I am conscious of the world around me. I am conscious of myself, that I am a unique individual. I am different from everybody else. I have my own train of thought, my own emotions, my own will, my own intellect, and I also have God consciousness as well. The flesh was formed from the dust of the earth, and so the flesh's source is the earth, and that's where it returns when it dies. God breathed into man the breath of life. That means the spiritual part of man, the soul, came from that which is spiritual, which is God. The original design and intention was that the physical part of us, which is the lesser part, because it came from where? The earth, right? Would be a mere servant, would be a case, a vehicle, for the spiritual man, which is the greater because it came from God. Since the fall, there has been a perversion of that order. For the souls of men have been led by and have been subservient to the desires, desires of his lesser part, which is his flesh. What does the Bible teach us about the flesh? Number one, that it is temporal. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 24. The Bible says, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away. The glory of man is temporal. No matter how glorious you may be right now. It is a fading glory. The desires of the flesh are temporal. The pleasures of the flesh are temporal. The beauty of the flesh is temporal. Doesn't matter how good you look this morning. You knew I was going to elaborate on that. But I won't. It's, it's too tempting. It's too easy. The strength of the flesh is temporal. The wisdom of the flesh is temporal. And the treasures of the flesh are temporal. All flesh is as grass. 
everything the flesh can achieve, obtain, and experience is temporal. I can't remember which Olympic it was. Usain Bolt ran 9.58 seconds on 100 meters. He attained a peak. Today he cannot run that fast. What he obtained, that glory, though it stands as a record, for himself to replicate it over and over and over, temporal. The body gets weaker. The bones get frailer. The hair gets grayer. I was going to talk about finning and balding, but I wish not to mock such things when I may be subject to them myself. Everything it can do is temporal. Everything it can achieve is glory. The glory of man is as the flower of the grass. For many, this is all that they live for what they can see, what they can touch, what they can feel, what they can obtain. It is vanity of vanities to live for that which is only going to return to dust. The Bible teaches us that it is temporal. The Bible also teaches us that the flesh is sinful. Romans 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, the, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Why do people die? Because all have sinned. The fall of man, which we read in Genesis, was an entry point of sin into the human race. And of course, its consequences have played out. Death spread to all men because all sinned. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20, I find this very interesting. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. You can do good. You can be in the flesh and do good, do you know that? And you're like, no you can't, yes you can. You can do good, you can just be in the flesh, nothing spiritual about you, don't believe in God, not interested, you can open the door for someone. You can, you can see, see someone there in need and you just buy them a coffee or drink. Hey, the scripture says, hey, but there's not a just man because there's no one who does good, but you don't sin. You find me the best person. Oh, this person, no, there's no sin. I'm telling you, there is sin. It is spread to all men. Why? Because the flesh is sinful. It's our commonality. We have all sinned. Our sinful deeds, our sinful actions, our thoughts, sinful thoughts and desires are but an expression and a manifestation of our depraved nature that is the flesh. Paul was very honest in his assessment concerning himself, this part of himself, that be it anyway. In Romans 7 verse 18, for he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells this is an honest man he says in my that part of me this physical part of me he says nothing good dwells for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i do not find the flesh has been contaminated and been corrupted by sin it is bound toward lawlessness it is bound toward perversion and carnality and sensuality and lasciviousness that's a big word like spell that pastor <laughs> I, like, I don't know I just said it it is our depraved nature it is bent towards it. we find it easy to do wrong to do right can be a little bit more tricky James 1 Consider what James says. I'm making a case here. 14 to 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do you see the process there? Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. You're tempted because of what's in you. And what's in you, when it's conceived that desire, it has a baby called sin. And sin, when it's full grown, 
kills you. Think about it. Jesus says this, for a person to enter the kingdom of heaven, they must be born again. That's, a, that's an amazing statement. Man. We just say it like a person must be born again. But you've got to think about it. He's saying you born again like new start. I'm going to give you a new nature. You know why you have to be born again? And the Bible says this also. At the resurrection, at the rapture, that we will be given a new body, a new case, a new vehicle, a new vessel. You know why? Because the old has been contaminated. Jesus, like, you gotta be born again, man. That what that physical flesh that there is so corrupt. It's so contaminated. <laughs> How do we deem humanity? We, he needs to be born again. He needs a new nature in him. Something that died at the fall needs to be revived within his person. And then when he is resurrected, when I ret- or when I return, I need to give him a whole, we got to do away with that old case. Pastor Al Lambert came here a couple, a few years back, and he did this magic trick. Some of you are like, magic in church? <laughs> yeah. And so he got this jug of water, this glass of water, and he got this ink, and he was saying, saying how sin has contaminated us. And so you got the ink in the water, and the water was clear, and then the ink's in it. And now it's blue. It's dark blue. It's ink. It swirls it around. And he said, this is us in our sin. And we're like, man, that's us in our sin. We were like that. We were like, hey, man. You know, Christians, we don't really like, like, oh, me and my sin. We was like, all right. And so he gets this thing, which is like the cross. And he says, but Christ came in and died for our sin. And he puts it in the water. And he begins to swirl it around. And then the water turns clear again. Some of you are like, man, you had witchcraft in your church, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chemical. You put it in and it changes. It's science, really. So he says it, and everyone goes, yeah. And we did clap. We did clap. Because it worked. And he was humble with it. He was like, man, I hope this works. Because obviously, it says Jesus comes and cleans you from your sin. It stays blue. Then it's kind of like, it loses its potency. So he does it, and it turns clear. Right. So you can say, this is the born again believer. Here's my question to you. Which one of you would come up here and drink that water? None of you. Because he just put some ink in that thing. (laughs) I don't care what other chemical we put in there. I'm not drinking. It was contaminated. So as much as God is, hey, I'm better in Christ, that flesh is still contaminated. We need saving from our flesh. Our salvation is not just from the judgment of our sinful actions, but also from the power and influence from our sinful nature, which is the flesh. Until we step into eternity or until Jesus Christ comes back, the redeeming work that is happening in us is a posh word called sanctification. It is to be made holy. It looks like the increase of that new born again spiritual nature who wants to serve God, who is conscious of God, and a decrease of the flesh's carnal influence in your life. Prior to salvation, the flesh had all the influence. In Christ, that influence should decrease, and the influence of the spirit nature, the born again nature, needs to increase. Romans 8 and verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you see the comparison, the contrast? Galatians 5 and verse 16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The scripture speaks about this part of our person, the flesh, in no uncertain terms. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. It's temporal, it's sinful, we need to be continually redeemed from his influence and power in our lives. How you think about your flesh nature will determine the quality and the productivity of your walk in Christ. It will determine the level of victory and dominion you will have as a believer. Are you following me this morning? 
Here's rule number one. You cannot do Christianity in your flesh. It's not going to work. You know what Christianity in the flesh looks like? It looks like you being very inconsistent. Very inconsistent. That means Monday, and I'm exaggerating here, but I'm trying to make a point. I can live for Jesus. Tuesday, I'm drunk on the side of the road. Wednesday, someone brought me to church. And I got it right with God. <laughs> Thursday, off the momentum of Wednesday, I'm feeling good again. Friday, met the wrong person and I'm in the madness again. It's inconsistent. Because you're trying to do this in the flesh. You're trusting in your own ability to be able to live this life out. The flesh will not permit you to have a consistent walk with God. It won't permit it. It won't because the Bible says its desires are contrary to the spirit's, the spirit's desires. And so it just wants to get high. It wants to get drunk. It wants to fornicate. This is what the flesh wants to do. It wants to cuss and swear. And it wants to, if someone gets you mad, you ever, you ever, is, if someone get you mad, you ever feel like seeing something and throwing it at them? Maybe not, you're too spiritual. <laughs> that, that, that's the flesh. It's desires to do these things. And so it keeps tripping me up. And it makes my walk very inconsistent. You cannot do Christianity in the flesh. Many of the problems in the believer's life is sourced to the flesh. Many marital problems. Because someone, or both people, <laughs> is functioning in the flesh. I'm telling you, two people who can live like Christ can make a good marriage. I'm telling you right there. The flesh will bring many problems into a marital home. Let me tell you something. Many of the problems you find in a church, because Christians be acting in the flesh. Many relational problems. Many money problems. My flesh has been the source of them. Some of the most scandalous behaviors and actions and words that have come from Christian have been a result of the lust, the desires, and the manifestations of this depraved, lesser nature called the flesh. You see a Christian acting up, you see them compromising, you see them functioning in a way that's far from Christ like from Christ likeness. So don't think how could they be acting like this? No, understand they're in the flesh. You know, I'm a bit weary of these no victory, feel sorry for myself worship songs. You heard it later? Maybe not. I just, I'm just a bit weary. I'm not trying to cuss anybody, man. Let people sing their song, do what they do. But I'm just a bit weary of it. I think we've got to be careful with that. You know, these songs are just kind of like, you know, I just keep messing up over and over and over again. But God, you just keep forgiving me. Like, where's your victory, man? Like, I understand. Hey, I'm just man, slip, fall, get back up seven times, etc. I get God's grace, God's forgiveness. But we can have victory. What it seems to me is a legacy, a story of, I just tried to do this thing led by my flesh. And then every so often, I just get like some spiritual supplement. It's kind of like, you know, you're not feeling well. And so then you go and you're going to take all this vitamin C and stuff. <laughs> like, need that boost. <laughs> and you think it's like going to instantly make you. And so many people just see like, okay, I'll just come to church or I'll read my Bible or I'll watch a sermon, etc. It's like this little supplement trying to keep this spiritual part of me alive. But the reality is the flesh is dictating the mouth. And if you're led by the flesh, you're just not going to have any victory as a Christian. You're going to find this hard. Like, is it not hard? What I may face is hard. The challenges that occur are hard. Uh, the responsibilities can be difficult. Sometimes the decisions that need to be made can be difficult. But to live for Jesus, it doesn't have to be that hard. But in the flesh, to live out a Christian life, that's, that's, that's a hard task right there. Until there is victory, until there is dominion over this part of yourself, you're going to struggle to live biblically. Your flesh is your biggest hindrance in you living biblically. It's like this is what the Bible says. 
This is your life. You matching that, your biggest hindrance is your flesh. Amen, Pastor Leon. It's the reason why we struggle to do what the Bible says. It hinders our application of scripture in our lives. It what, it's what holds us back from giving ourselves to the things of God. Like so you say, all right, I'm going to get up. I'm going to pray like every morning. Your flesh will have something to say about that. Your flesh will be like, you know, we need 20 more minutes sleep. <laughs> That's what we need to do. It quenches your fire. That's what it is. Man, I just, be on fire. I just want to be on fire for God. Yeah, your flesh is your issue. You wait, you're waiting for this magic wand to be waved. You need to crucify that flesh. That's what's holding you back. That's what's quenching it. The flesh does not want you living clean. It does not want, or it would hinder your appetite for the presence of God. It will hinder your appetite for the things of God. It does not want you to be devoted. It doesn't want you to be given to his will or to his purposes. The flesh, uh, he's just not into it. He might broker you a deal and say, all right, you can go to church like every so often, but don't make it every week. Come on. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> he's, yeah, I'm t- he's not into it. He's not into it. He's like the word. He's not into it. Prayer, giving, faithfulness, evangelism. <laughs> he's not having it. He doesn't want to forgive. He doesn't want to love. He doesn't want to keep a heart right. He wants that heart toxic, man. He doesn't want to sacrifice. He doesn't want to do any of these things. And living a Christian life in the flesh, dictated by it, often causes us to be very blasé and unwilling, carnal, disinterested in many of what I've stated above. There are many Christians who are underachieving concerning their God-given potential. Why? Because of the flesh. That's it. The flesh will find all other excuses for you, by the way. It'll be creative in that. I say, no, it's because of this, because of this, because of this. No, the real, let's just, let's just get past all that fluff. It's the flesh. It is the greatest enemy concerning me and you walking in God's way, walking in a spirit led life, walking a Christ like life. Our flesh pretty heavy stuff to think that the greatest enemy is is you well a part of you anyway (laughs) and it just it's not into it doesn't want to know and that's the wrestle that any person who comes to the faith finds himself in prior to it it was just like a great agreement it's like the ref was like, for the guys. It's like, ah, it's out there. <laughs> Got saved, and now this part was like, no, don't want to do that. And then I hear a sermon on it. I'm like, oh, my days. This is so wrong. <laughs> and then there's a wrestle now. What am I going to do? I'm going to choose to continue to be led by it, or I'm going to be led by the Spirit. And that part of me needs to die. That part of me is very destructive. It's caused a lot of problems, has a legacy of them. But this side of me offers me a future and a hope. But that's coming to the conclusion of my sermon. I don't want to get there just yet. <laughs> Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It's like the scripture saying, like, this is where it's leading you to death and dysfunction and destruction. That's, it's, just, it's bent on that. It will pleasure you all the way to that point. That's how it functions, but it will get you there. It's like a train, this is where it's headed. It doesn't go any other way, it just, it just heads down here. But then it says this, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. I, I, I like the way Paul writes, you know. He's like, you, there's certain things that you, you need to kill, you know. The dead certain things about you, the deeds. There's deeds of the flesh, they need to die. This is Christianity today, church. They need to die. If you, if, I'm just thinking, and I shouldn't do this, but if you got that on a soundbite, you'd be like, why is he preaching? They need to die. <laughs> Who? <laughs> the deeds of the flesh. 
things that feed the flesh that, that it wants and that is wrong, it's like those things need, they need to die, man. These things cannot live because they only bring death to my life. Put the flesh in its place. It's a servant. It's a vehicle, but it is not a master. And then it says, the scripture says, for as many are led by the spirit of God, as many are led by the spirit, that means you invest into the spiritual part of you. Things that are good for your soul. Things that will contribute to your walk with God. You know those things are the stuff your flesh doesn't want to do. What a fight you have going on inside you and me. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27. Here's a key here. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Less, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So Paul's like, how do I like, stay on top of my game, so to speak? Because I'm preaching and people watching and all that kind of stuff. And I've got to live what I minister. He says, this flesh, I discipline it. I discipline it. Victory over the flesh is not deliverance, but discipline. Deliverance is a moment of freedom. So I do believe in deliverance. Pray for you, you got addiction, whatever. God will set you free. Okay? That's a moment. So it's like you stepped out. But you don't want to go back in, do you? Discipline is a lifestyle of dominion. It keeps you free. And so I realized I got, Jesus set me free, but now I want to stay free. It means i got to have victory and dominion over this side of me. I have to learn how to tell my flesh no powerful word that is no 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 go say it no see like, like trying, to, trying to trying to spit the word out it's like your flesh was denying you uh sorry so i shouldn't like it's like are you mocking us like, <laughs> here's the reality this morning you have the choice to be as carnal as you want to be or as spiritual as you want to be it's totally down to you. You can be completely given over to the fact, hey, just give it whatever it wants. Live according to its desires and its lusts. Or you can be as Christ-like as you want to be. It's down to how we think about our flesh. You know how we think about it? We think about it, number one, we don't think it's too bad. Like, some don't see their flesh as that bad. It's like, all that I've said, it's like, okay, I'm not that bad. <laughs> My flesh is not that wicked. And maybe you see the scriptures that I've read as a bit extreme. That's a bit extreme. Like, put it to death and its deeds and it needs to be crucified and all this kind of stuff. You see, your flesh maybe is misunderstood. It made some mistakes in life, but it really doesn't mean no harm. It's just a product of its environment, you know, its past. <laughs> It's done some bad things, but it's not intrinsically evil or wicked. Who wants to ascribe these things to themselves? So we was like, hey, most men will proclaim their own goodness, the Bible says. And so because we don't see it as that bad, sometimes we make the mistake of befriending it. So we look after the flesh, you know. Christians, we're so smart, man. We, are. We, we know how to, we, 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 it's like, I don't know, it's just some perverse relationship we have with it where we will beat it down a bit, but every so often, you know, yeah. give it something nice. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry for how I've treated you, you know, <laughs> but I want to make it to heaven, but I still love you. <laughs> ah, sorry, I watched too many cartoons when I was growing up. Uh, we treat it, we'll make provisions for it, we will defend it. It's got this little, little, you know, like you got a meal, like won't give it a meal, but you have a snack cupboard in your house. Anyone got a snack cupboard in your house? You have the snack cupboard, it's got your biscuits and your chocolates and your sweets. It's like, you just got your little snack cupboard for your flesh. And you will defend that with your life. Don't even preach on any of those things, Pastor. Don't even list them. You want to list them right now? Don't do it. Don't do it. Because they're for my flesh. Provisions. Because we don't see it as that bad. That's just how we think about it. That's why we do that. That's why we function like that as believers. We underestimate in our thinking its potential for evil. We deny the depths of the flesh's sinfulness. 
partly, partly I believe that's because we here are in a context or a bubble of wealth, comfort, security and convenience. And it facilitates civility. Our wealth and our comforts and our security. Most people can work a job and earn money or do what they're doing. And it facilitates an environment where people would generally act civil. But let me tell you something. If that ever gets threatened, you will see people switch. Everyday, ordinary people start acting crazy. Like they want petrol. <laughs> They're lying. An ordinary working man, probably has a wife and kids, comes out and he wants to punch the next guy in the face. I think in one instance, someone pulled out a knife. People breaking into people's cars, trying to get, just, just any little disruption. People start losing, and you start, wow, people acting like flesh. But because we're in this lovely little comfortable bubble, we felt, no, people aren't, ain't got that kind of potential within them. You know, there, there was a, there's been two, actually, stories in the paper recently. The Wayne Cousins one, and there's this other one, this, this teacher who was murdered down in southeast London. And the guy who's been arrested of it, one of the neighbors said, I always know him, I've always known him to be a nice man. He says, anytime we live in the same apartment, he sees me come out with my pram, he helps me carry the buggy downstairs and opens the door. Sometimes with the rubbish, he'll take it down for me and put it out. Nice man. But the reality is, there's a potential of evil inside of human beings. Jordan Peterson, uh, who's very well known at the moment, bit of a controversial figure, he says, people have a great capacity for evil. He says, I didn't really understand it uh, that of myself, though. But when I did, I became terrified of how terrible I could potentially be. There are things that you could be doing tomorrow that you would never have dreamed of doing today. I could have backed that statement up because your nature is sinful. That flesh is being corrupted by sin. If we had to spend two months in your mind, we would want to get out <laughs> after about 20 minutes. And it would be torturous for us. And when we came out, we would never look at you the same again. <laughs> the flesh. Poor Peter, he didn't realize it. That a few later hours after the Last Supper, He's going to be doing something that in that present moment, he utterly abhorred even the concept and the thought of. Deny you, Jesus. Because we've all have sin working in our flesh and this potential for evil. We have no problem seeing it in others, by the way. You ever notice that? We have no problem. Everybody else has a potential for evil. But not me. <laughs> not me. You know, it's like, can't let, you know, children go around the corner to the shop in the evening, are you mad? There's people out there. And they're psychos, axe murderers and killers. Like, anyway, it could be him, it could be him, it could be her. <laughs> right? Come on, that's the reality. That's why you're going to have children and things. We want your DBS checked, we want all this stuff in. Why? Because we understand. Yeah, even that nice person there could be a. Yeah. There's potential of evil in others. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody else, psychos and murderers, and the person walking too closely behind me, psycho, <laughs> right? Everybody else can be as evil as it gets, but we don't see that. We, we super, super, what's the word? Superliciously. Huh, you didn't even think that was a word, did you? It is. It is. It means to be arrogant. We overlook, we overlook ourselves in this, in this regard. This is how we think about our flesh. I'm not talking about how you think about other people. It's how we think about ourselves. But it's the wrong mentality to have. The wrong which many, I'm telling you, there's people, man, who in one part of their life, this thing that was so wrong, later on in life, they love it. There's people who in, in one part of life, they criticize other people for a certain thing. Now they're addicted to it. Never thought that their heart would be, ever be so hardened before God. No, not me. No, I love God. I love, yeah? Never thought they would bring so much pain and cursing into their loved ones' lives. 
do not underestimate the depravity of this sinful nature. Because those who underestimate it will not take it seriously and therefore will not take biblical measures concerning it. Thus you will walk in it, you will trust in it, you have confidence in it, you will make provisions for it, you will defend it. Even in your walk with God, you will do it in your own strength. The scripture says that the spirit, Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh cannot hold spiritual things, man. It can't do it, just cannot do it. We have to renew our mind concerning the flesh. The admonition of the scripture is put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You find that in Romans 13 and verse 14. Now let me bring this to a conclusion because I don't know how long I've been yakking on for. Verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. As many who are led by. So prior to it, it's talking about, it's almost like being anti-flesh, right? It's like, man, put the deeds, the, 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 uh, put the death, the deeds of the flesh. But it says, but as many who are led by, they're following, they're going in the way of the Spirit. These are the sons of God. So here's the good mentality to have. It's not just to be anti-flesh. Because I can stop the sermon there. And be like, man, it's like, okay, flesh, you're going to get a beat down. <laughs> Put your knuckle dusters, man. You know, so, okay, anyway. And so, and so you, and you do. And, and anti, 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 anti is okay, but you're not pro walking in the spirit. And so now doing right is just affliction. <laughs> so, oh, it's like, oh, man, like, gosh, you know. So you, know, you, need, you need to be anti flesh. Pro spirit, pro walking in this new divine nature that God has miraculously regenerated in my person. Here's the wonder of walking in the spirit. Its potential is the opposite of the flesh. Let me break this down. See, the flesh has a potential for evil. That's what we're talking about, right? The spirit has a potential for godliness, right? And so, man, the more and more I give myself to the flesh, man, I can find myself in some dark, dark places, doing some dark, dark things. But the more and more and more I give myself to this new spirit nature, the more Christ-like I can become. The more godliness emanates from my life. And so, with the flesh, we were saying, yeah, tomorrow I could be doing something really bad that today I'd be like, no, I would never do that. All right, when it comes to the spirit, there are things that you think are impossible today that you can be doing tomorrow. Things that you're like, nah, not me, not me. You know, prior to going into the ministry, doing what I'm doing now was like, nah. <laughs> like, you know, I might say, yeah, yeah, I want to go. But man, really deep down, I'm like, man, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know, right? But it came through, hey, walking, being led, living this Christian life in the spirit. There's people, man, it's like, man, I could never, I could never lead worship. I could never stand in front of people and preach the word of God. No, lead, lead. no, no, no. Today, what you think is impossible, you walk in the ways of Christ, you see it become a reality. I can never be that father. I can never be such a husband. Me married with children and a home and uh, no, not me, no. If you walk in the spirit, Today, which you think is like this mountain before you, tomorrow you can be standing on top of it. I can never know my word like this. I can never pray like that. I never could live that life, that consistent Christianity that has victory and dominion, free from all these addictions and all this. Man, I, man I'm struggling. I want to, but I don't know if I ever could. Walk in the spirit, my brother and my sister. And today, which you, that which you think is impossible will actually be a reality tomorrow. That which you are struggling with today, you can be a master of tomorrow. You can have victory of tomorrow. That which you're battling today, you can have success in, in tomorrow if you're spirit-led. So it's more than just, okay, I'm an anti-flesh, you know, protest, anti-flesh, right? It's like, no, I'm pro-spirit. I'm pro-walking in the ways of Christ. 
because there's all these things when sometimes, you know, we're honest, we assess ourselves that, man, I don't know if I could ever, I'm not sure if I could. You walk in the spirit, man. God will, God will make these things happen. This is why the Bible, I'm, I'm concluding, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Isn't that amazing? He's like, man, I, I could do everything through Christ. I walk spirit led. That's why the scripture says, Christ in us is what? The hope of glory. Things that I think, no, I'm not. Me, really, can be because Christ is in me. I preach this message, and I believe if we change our mind in the way we think about this, we would adopt this mentality. I believe it's time for believers to stop underachieving. Mm, Figure it, you've got a divine nature. You're saved, you're born again this morning. You have divine nature in you. Born again, born of the Spirit, right? New nature. Am I fulfilling that? Am I walking in that? Am I entering all that God would have for me? We've got to ask ourselves that question. Because the thing that's making us underachieve the most is that other nature. It's what's holding us back and it's what's hindering us. I say think about the possibilities of God. Walking in the ways of Christ. Deny your flesh so you can reach your potential in Jesus. Think about it differently, church. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Respect to God. Person next.